thing. So welcome to uh, Pacific Islands Fisheries Group uh, Diversification Workshop. And um, we, we are doing this um, together with Clay Tam, my partner at Pacific Islands Fisheries Group. And uh, PIFG is, as you know, a nonprofit that has been interested in keeping the culture of fishing alive in the Hawaiian Islands. And they, we publish Levaya Magazine. And uh, for the most part, PIFG has been involved in um, ground fish tagging. And since 2014, 2015, have partnered with us, um, uh, myself and my collaborator, Tim Lamb, uh, who on the East Coast and Gloucester, Mass are known as the Large Pelagics Research Center. And as some of you know, um, I'm a scientist. I'm not an economics expert or diversification expert. But the bottom line is that we at PIFG and, and just about anybody that works with fishermen know that the market and diversification and all the challenges that you're up against have been a real uh, challenge, especially now. All uh, seafood and fishermen are, are faced with even more heightened challenges with cost of fuel, with getting their catch out and to the markets, with more and more consolidation and 95% of our seafood or thereabouts is imported. And these challenges are even more daunting today. And here on Kauai, despite the, uh, the, the, the supply of plentiful supply, particularly of tunas, of ahi, and then our ground fish, Kauai is considered a rural island that has great access to fish, incredibly accomplished fishermen, but has unique challenges as far as our market. And that's been part of history, part of what resources have been available to Kauai, and the real lack of focus as on seafood, like elsewhere, as seafood safety and as an important part of food security. But as you all know, COVID has changed everything. So in 2019 and 2020, 50, we submitted a proposal that's been funded by uh, NOAA's Salt and Stall Kennedy Program. And that was to help bring ideas about ways that Kauai's small boat fleet might diversify, add value, and basically have a, um, a possible approaches to doing the kinds of things that our panelists such as yourselves have done successfully. And so you're here today to share your ideas and your, um, your successes on how you did it and some of the problems that you faced um, in diversifying your businesses. I'd like to tell also our attendees that our four speakers today are all New Englanders. And uh, they're in some of the oldest fishing communities in the country, just like Hawaii. And a couple of them are from Gloucester, Mass, which some of you know, is known as the oldest seaport in the US and the continental US, and also uh, made famous by television shows and history, Captain's Courageous uh, by the Perfect Storm, and including, uh, dare I say, one of our panelists who is one of the stars of National Geographic's Wikituna. So they're coming from old New England, and they're going to talk about their experiences today. And again, one quick note on, um, uh, remember to unmute yourself when you're speaking. Um, don't forget, if you're just joining us, to uh, put in the chat box, if you don't mind, who you are. And um, we certainly want to know who's with us. And um, with that, I'm going to kick off our first introduction. We're going to go alphabetically. So I'm, I'm going to start with uh, Bob Campbell. Um, Bob Campbell is, uh, is one of the founders of Yankee Co-op, but he's also known as one of the top tuna expert buyers in the Northeast. I know Bob personally from our own work um, with Yankee Co-op, but Bob has been working with um, as, as a buyer and as a marketer for um, Chubby Fish uh, for the many years. He's based in Rhode Island, and when he's one of the top guys, annoying not just tuna, but from his past lobsters, ground fish, and just about everything else. Um, Bob started with um, Yankee Co-op. He's one of the founders with, I'm going to check my notes, by the way, um, with Red Perkins going back to 1990. And Yankee Co-op is still in operation today. It's in uh, um, C uh, sorry, in New Hampshire, 
and it started um, basically a facility that was made available as a dock from a, the nuclear power plant or the power plant in in Seacoast. And Bob, I know not just for his ex incredible experience with tuna and other species, his help for the science projects that my lab and my students conducted, but Bob has always been innovating, um, even for tuna, best possible care, um, ideas about how to bring the freshest quality um, seafood to the market. And so he has been an innovator as long as I know him and many years before. And so with that, I'd like to introduce Bob Campbell and I'm gonna unmute him. And from the little state of Rhode Island with the big influence on seafood. <laughs> Thank you, Molly, I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Bob Campbell, and uh, a little bit about my background is, is that uh, straight out of college, I didn't want to uh, get roped into my, my field of expertise, so I went fishing in the mid-1970s, and to this day, I'm still in the fishing business. So, so, so much for uh, my college career. It, uh, sort of didn't mean much of anything, but it did. And anyways, uh, I, went, uh, I went to work as a commercial fisherman and I was a commercial fisherman until 19, the end of 1990. And then I started, uh, uh, I took over uh, a, a fisherman's co-op in Newburyport, Mass. And, uh, and five years later, we merged, uh, we merged businesses with uh, the Yankee Co-op in New Hampshire and got everybody together, got all the fishermen together. We handled, oh, ground fish, lobsters, tuna fish. So we've gone from a, a tuna fishing uh, co-op to a, we have diversified over the years to handle any product uh, basically our thought was, and my thought is, is that anything the fishermen, our fishermen could catch, we needed to be able to sell. So right off the bat, we had a, we had a, a little bit of an uh, uh, advantage, I think, over some people who were, who were happy doing what they were doing, catching, the, you know, catching their fish and selling it. And, and those businesses that were just handling one or two products and, and, uh, I think that the key to survival and, and especially in this day is to, uh, is to diversify and handle as much, many different products if you can, as you can, and, uh, and as many different types of product, uh, meaning that if you're just catching the ahi, uh, you have to be able to, uh, to uh, do some, some, it means more work on the fisherman's part or on the buyer's part, but uh, you have to install in your head that no customer is too small. You have to do value added such as uh, uh, you have to cut line sometimes, uh, sometimes you, you have to freeze, you have to cryovac and freeze. Sometimes you've got to smoke fish. Um, Molly sent me a, 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 you know, an interesting article on a, on a, a, a gentleman that was doing smoking and, and, and that's, a, that's a huge thing and especially this year where the cost of fuel and the cost of, uh, of getting thing anywhere, the, uh, the fuel surcharges on the trucks, the fuel, the, the, the surcharges on the, uh, on the air freight, it, it, it's a it's a challenge, but especially this year, where we have uh, where we have so much going on, we have the COVID, we have uh, you know we have the yen at at you know around 129, which is the weakest it's been in a long time. So the we really have to get creative to uh, um, to move the product, and the more product that that you can move locally, the better off you're going to be because it's going to incur less cost. And that's the thing that, that's got to be in people's head this year, especially with, the, with everything that's going on between the yen, between the fuel, between COVID, 
Um, it, it's going to be an interesting year. It's going to, uh, you know, it, it's it's going to, you know, mean working harder to maybe make a little bit less. But uh, this year here is, is it's hopefully is going to be. I know we've been saying this. We've all been saying this for a couple of years since we've been in the in the COVID problem. But uh, I think that this year here is is going to be a, a a year that we just try to um, try to maintain and build for the for the future. Because I I think this year here. It's going to be very tough for uh, for businesses as well as as the fishermen because they've got to pay increased insurance, increased fuel. I mean, baits are going to increase. Everything is going to is is tied in together, and uh, and you know then you know, what we did is uh, at Yankee Co-op is we we started a retail store. Um, that's another thing that that you know that we should have seen earlier, but it it it's really has taken off now, um, especially with COVID. Uh, you know, people still have to eat. They're doing their uh, they're doing very well in their in their retail stores. They have they you know hand them a lot of product that the that their own fishermen catch. And uh, and they're moving it locally, and and uh, that's one of the things that we have uh, as as buyers. You know, we've been trying to educate fishermen like Dave. Ao is a, is an educated fisherman, and he knows you know how to take care of fish and and what it takes on on our end and his end to move fish. But we need to uh, we need to get to more fishermen, but one of the things that uh, that I found out recently is that I did another one of these Zoom meetings uh, with a, a bunch of uh, a bunch of people, a bunch of chefs, and a bunch of uh, uh, restaurateurs. And their their big thing is that, uh, and this is talking about bluefin, not the uh, not the ahi. But uh, but the big thing was uh, they were all afraid about sustainability. Now you know, and and I was telling this to uh, to Molly the other day when I was talking to her, and it's like it, that really surprised me because I thought we had done we as buyers had done a good job of uh, of letting our end users and letting the fishermen know that this is a sustainably caught product and and you know and the fishermen have done a great job those that are participating that know how to take that uh take care of the fish that are willing to go the extra extra mile to take care of the fish um they you know it's uh it's it sort of left me kind of like stunned that that all of these people are reading something that, uh, um, and I will name it Fish Watch, um, that uh, that says that the bluefin are are still overfished and and on the endangered list. Yet our government, and I don't really um, uh, support our <laughs> all of our our government. Uh, um, sayings but but you know in december of 2019 they came out with a big story saying that bluefin tuna was sustainably managed and harvested and it's right there on their website and i sent it to a couple of uh, a couple of people from the other meeting and it's like you know geez how can you you know how can you 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 know, you believe without knowing anything what one person says and but not believe what the uh, the the agency in charge of the management says but <clears throat> but anyway so so that's another thing that uh, that has to be done is that everybody from the fishermen to the end users have got to be got to be on the same boat and uh, you know there's you know the fishing you know takes an entire community to uh 
to to make successful and that would mean that you know that the fishermen that go out every day they've got to buy fuel they've got to buy bait they've got to buy ice they get they get food for their uh for their trips i mean you know it's not just one thing or the other and get the uh you know try to uh Try to get the community involved. Get the get more people and and in on this. Educate the the end consumers as to what fresh local fish is, and <clears throat> and I mean fresh as in uh, uh, wild caught, not as in fresh frozen that they buy from uh, some of the big chain stores. Um, that are raised in farms, and uh, I am totally, totally uh, against anything that's uh, that's raised in a farm. And and I'm sorry if there are some uh, there are some you know farms that do it correctly and do it the right way, but uh, very, very, very few. And and uh, you know I, I think that uh, the word has been out. Um, we've done everything from uh, from uh, farmers markets all the way through, you know, to to try to get word to the people and word to the uh, to the end users that there is nothing like a fresh local wild caught product. So on that, I am I am going to end it. Um, unless there's any questions, I I appreciate the time and and uh, and thank Molly for for all the work that she's done to help our bluefin and and uh, and it's been uh, it's been very rewarding to be part of the part of, a little bit little part of uh, of helping her and uh, and her students uh, do what they do what they do best. Thank, thank you, Bob, for your for your thoughts and really important uh, comments. But I, I want to make sure you at least get a two minutes at least in on. Can you please tell us when you founded Yankee Co-op with members? Can you give us just a couple minutes on the founding of your co-op and why you did it? Because that's an important piece for Kauai. Thank well, you. Actually, actually, the uh, uh, I was at the Tri-Coastal Co-op in Newburyport, Mass. <clears throat> and uh, and uh, they had this dock over in New Hampshire, which was used to stage for the uh, nuclear power plant there. And they were looking to turn that over to the town of, uh, of Seabrook in New Hampshire and wanted to know what they, what they could do in order to best serve the locals and um you know uh, a few few days later because i was at tricoastal for in massachusetts for five years and then uh and then uh it got to the point where fishing had slowed a little bit the uh the boats uh that were uh, always coming to us in in Massachusetts were now split because the uh, the Yankee Co-op actually started a couple of years before I got there, so I came in to work with the uh, the the gentleman that was running that place, and uh, after a couple of weeks, he told me that he was he was leaving, so. I <laughs> I ended up uh, um, you know uh, doing uh, doing a bunch of stuff that uh, uh, that I was shooting off the hip for with and and uh, but this is the the whole thing there there's uh, when I left there was 56 members of the co-op and uh, everyone was uh, was selling their product there and buying their bait and. And uh, you know we handled all sorts of stuff. Like I said, diversification is uh, was key and is, is still key, not only on the wholesale end but also on the retail end. Um, 
the uh, um, a lot of the uh, probably half of the uh, uh, members of uh, Yankee Co-op are lobstermen, and it's not a, a huge lobster uh, industry there in New Hampshire, but it's enough that uh, that you know it that keeps us going, or it kept us going when uh, when we didn't. Another thing that we did up until um things got a little bit uh a little bit crazy here is that we held a tuna auction and uh i was involved with tuna auctions up until uh you know up until the mid 2000s and uh we had anywhere from five to nine buyers there and we'd spread the fish out and and uh and take samples and you know give them core samples give them tail cuts and uh you know, we had, uh, like I said, five to nine buyers. We had domestic buyers there. We had export buyers there. We had, you know, guys that did both. And uh, that was another option that that uh, that we had. Well, so it sounds that, like um, yes. you're revealing your diversification and your thinking. And I think um, <laughs> with, with follow-up, just I know we have to stay on our schedule, but with follow-up, I think what will be really helpful um, I'll speak with you um, at another time as far okay. as the mindset that allowed that made a group of fishermen band together for a co-op and that is um, that will be part of the story in the future. So thanks a lot, Bob. I appreciate that. And oh, you're um, welcome, Molly. Thank you for the time. I appreciate and it. And thank you welcome. for all, and, all you guys. Thank and you. Thank you. So um, our next panelist, expert panelists, we're going alphabetically is Vito Gicoloni Jr. And Vito, if you can un unmute. Yeah, you're the, I'm one on... of the youngest guys here. Hi. You, yeah, you yeah. Be good so... at Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I I'm, know. I'm, so yeah, Vito Gicoloni, uh, I own Fisherman's Wharf. Can wait, you guys wait, hear wait. me? Wait, hang, hang on one second. Oh, yeah. I'm, going to, I'm going to give you an introduction. Um, oh, okay. Let, let me do it, um, if you don't yeah, mind. Yeah. You're going to get to talk, but I'm going to introduce you. The because it's a I'll pleasure. take your time. <laughs> Vito is one of the uh, hardworking um, expert panelists that I've had a really hard time tracking down, even though we live in the same town some of the year. Um, uh, Vito, um, I was particularly sort of, I know his father, Vito Sr., who is well known to our New England uh, community. Um, I know his dad personally, but I didn't know the kids until much later when I read a, um, a story in Edible Boston is, uh, what is it, Five Fishermen in a War, or something like that. And it was a really amazing uh, story about Vito Jr.'s uh, brothers who um, basically came together to start an entirely new uh, business and enterprise from his fishing family. Um, I'm going to use some notes. Uh, Vito Sr. ended up uh, purchasing a wharf, and sorry if I have some inaccuracies, Vito, um, mm -hmm. uh, that he wanted to keep um, in fishing. And uh, Vito's family are really important players in the sustainability of our fi of Gloucester fishing community. And again, uh, his whole family demonstrated the commitment to keeping fresh fish coming in to a working uh, community. And so um, uh, there's so much to say, but uh, yep. Vito is one of the brothers that um, formed the uh, Fisherman's, um, Fisherman's Wharf auction. And I really had my eyes opened by their business, which I knew about from, uh, for a lot of reasons, but um, returning in Gloucester from a, a, tr a trip back from Kauai, I saw this amazing fish truck that was parked outside the fish auction and the, and the wharf um, and saw an incredible um, sign up front advertising fresh fish that they were selling to our community and a line of cars down the street to purchase the fish. And so for a number of reasons, this was before COVID even, we saw that the Gigoloni brothers had really started thinking about getting fish out to the community in really cool, innovative ways. And so I could go on about their history and all kinds of stuff, the fish plant, you name it. But hopefully that's an introduction of why Vito is here today because he, their family has had spectacular examples 
of commitment to the community and also particularly innovation. Okay, Vito, thank you. Welcome. All right. Well, thank you, Molly. Thanks for everybody for joining. Uh, can you hear me well? So in 2008 is actually when it all started. My father was a fisherman and contrary to what a lot of people thought was he never opened up this business, right? And people thought, oh, he, the, the sons joined his fish business. He was never in as a fish dealer. He was a fisherman. I don't know why he went into construction for years and years and then got back into the industry, couldn't get away from it. I guess once a fisherman, always a fisherman, so to speak, is what he says. But I couldn't really stand fishing. Every time we went out for a five-day trip, I was like, why don't we turn him back? I was hoping <laughs> I was hoping half the catches weren't too much fish so I could just get home, but we didn't really care about the money. I don't think he ever gave us a full share anyway, so we just we never got that taste of it, you know. And he was just trying to pay the bills at the time, and we didn't care. We were trying to help him out in high school when he had this little boat that he did on the side, and then he was into fisheries management and all that stuff that we knew nothing about. But uh, you know, these folks from New Bedford, uh, known as um, the Whalen City Auction, had wanted to come into Gloucester. They wanted to try to expand what they were doing in New Bedford. And the, the current auction really wasn't doing a great job of what they were doing. Um, so as we were offloading, you know, I remember, you know, guys wouldn't catch our lines. And I'm like, that that ticked me off being out at sea at five, six days. And there's nobody there to greet us. And now that I have my, my own offloading facility, I realized there's more to just catch the lines um, to run an auction. So, you know, basically we opened the doors up. We, our wharf wasn't even ready. It was just a vacant building, basically, uh, we started at, at this decrepit wharf that we got inspected at the last minute. Me and my brothers had no money in our pockets. We just started, you know, literally painting this, this cooler that barely even worked. I don't know how we got it inspected in the past, but it was the happiest day of our life because we thought that we had, a, you know, there was a potential to do something with our lives, right? So besides try to go to college, which I dropped out after one year, I said, I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to do my own thing. And same with my brothers. I was actually 22 years old at the time. So we started with zero boats and we opened the doors up and we said, we're offloading 24 hours a day. So the day boats at the time were catching cod and yellowtail. Dave Marciano probably remembers they had the 800 pound limit and I think it was 400 pound limit on the yellowtail. And they were coming in just one after another because we were open 24 hours and the other auction wasn't. So that was, that was kind of cool. It was cool to see me and my brothers just offloaded, you know, boat after boat and we sent it onto the auction. Um, we kept our independence, even though we didn't start, you know, the LLC, but we never ever took a paycheck from the auction because we didn't want, we wanted our own independence. We wanted to be entrepreneurs. So we did that for about three years until finally the inspector told us, get the heck out of this building. I gave you a three month, you know, uh, okay to be in this decrepit wharf now you got to get in your, your family's wharf, you know, that was unfinished. So I told my father, we got to hurry up. We got to get in there before we get kicked out of here. And we got the place ready within months. Um, so we started offloading boats here. We continued doing the auction for years, but it slowly started to change with the industry, the regulations, the catch shares forced some of the small boats out. And then we started to adapt to the big boats. Um, so we offloaded sometimes hundred thousand pound plus, um, can you guys still see me? 100,000 pound plus boats. Um, we, you know, and basically, you know, it would take you the whole day to offload at 15 hours or so. And that was really good for business. Uh, you really had to put the volume through these doors to keep up with the electric, the labor, the utilities, the, you know, flood insurance. I mean, you name it. Um, the expenses are enormous. They're astronomical. And a lot of the fishermen don't see that. You know, and I totally understand it because the only thing I saw when I was fishing for the few times was who was catching my lines. So the expenses of owning the business and running it is astronomical. And we needed those hundred thousand you know, pound trips at least once a week or at least uh, the amount of boats to add up to that. So slowly but surely, the business adapted even more where the fishermen's out, a fisherman that was unloading with us had his own buyers that were buying from him. And we had no choice but to do what he said. So we basically just took our fees and did what he had to, where, where he wanted to send his stuff. And that's how we adapted from the auction to more direct sales. So we started to see what he was selling and who he was selling to. And we learned that real quick. Um, and basically we adapted from selling to the auction to not even using the auction at all anymore. 
Um, actually, the only thing we sell, we sold this year on the auction was scallops. So, and the reason being is just that when the industry is, is changing so quickly, you have to change with it. You can't just be all or nothing. Um, there's some buyers that just need stuff guaranteed. You know, they need a, a supply that's guaranteed and bidding on the auction really wasn't working for them anymore. And no, no knock against an auction system, but sometimes you have to adapt. You know, if you don't have as much pounds, we didn't have the 100,000 pound trips anymore. Corporate bought these boats that we were dealing with. And now on a smaller scale, we have to guarantee some of these buyers a product or we're going to lose them, right? So, um, so basically we started selling directly to these buyers. And that's another thing is now you have all this money out, right? You have receivables. Another thing that not too many people know about you know if they're fishermen and they don't see that but you go out 30 40 days and some of these guys will go out even more than that and you're out hundreds of thousands of dollars and for me and my brothers we would have never been able to do that unless it was years and years of what we did with the auction so i don't look back at what we did you know it was like everything was meant for a reason and you know has been shaping us to where we are today as a business right and if we were just all out auction and we just still with that we would have been out of business if we were all out direct sales, well, when the pandemic hit, we would have been out of business. So what we did was with the pandemic was all of a sudden all these boats started coming in. Um, you know, Dave and all of them can attest the prices just went to the floor. Uh, it was lobster prices were three, four dollars. I mean, everything was just very cheap. So we did the seafood uh, drive through and that worked really well. So that got us into the retail. Uh, to be, so that basically is what started our retail division. Uh, we have a, a seafood market drive through and a food truck, basically, uh, because the rest of our wharf wasn't built out. And it ended up being successful because it was convenient during the pandemic that people could just drive through, contact us and get this stuff. So that forced us again into another, you know, change of business. And, you know, a lot of people, you know, some people tied up their boats and stayed home and, you know, maybe they're not doing so well or some people just didn't continue with their their uh, you know seafood business and they didn't do too well there's a lot of businesses that are going out i know even the corporate business that took the boats out from us aren't doing so well you know so the seafood game is just not easy um and and no business really is easy and especially in this environment so it's crazy I and mean, me and my brothers every day talk about where are we going with the business what are we going to do are we going to start doing you know cooked items see uh, we don't do that you know, but is that where this industry is taking us? Do we have to get more value added products? Um, so every day, you know, we're trying to change. We're trying to adapt with it. You know, we want to add shipping to try to get out just, you know, right now we're just based in Gloucester and selling retail to Gloucester. Uh, we still have our wholesale division, which is not every day that you have ground fish boats. Um, luckily, the scallop boats just happen to come in and we have 50 to 60 of those landing every day. So that's really cool to see because, you know, they're renting houses around Gloucester and they're doing business with the, you know, local shops and whatnot. And all those docks have boats lined, you know, docking and paying some rent. And so it's great for business to see that. And, uh, and that was one thing that the government did, you know, just by opening the pen and saying, Hey, we're going to open this area. And now you got 60 scallopers, you know, coming into the port and we're offloading them from six in the morning to six at night. And it's like, well, that's how you can, that's how you can keep an industry going, you know? So this, the government definitely in Gloucester needs to do some more, um, you know, flexibility and help for some of these guys open up some areas, you know, the, there's no flexibility on our codfish, um, but obviously that's, you know, stuff you guys all read in the newspaper and see. So, so difficult, but for advice to the quiet fishermen and, and all that, and, and anybody in any businesses, you have to adapt and stay independent. You know, um, there was plenty of times where we probably could have sold to a corporate and worked for them. We never wanted to do that. Um, and I'm glad we did. I'm glad we stayed just independent. And I, I just want to be my own boss forever. I could never work for somebody. Um, so I think staying independent is one of the keys to our success, being able to adapt, not have to answer to anybody, um, you know, and, and basically, you know, just just adapting. Yeah. Just different things like uh, Bill was saying, where you have to, we're unloading whiting, we're unloading lobsters. We do, um, you know, ground fish, we do scallops. So we're not just, you know, keyed on one thing and that's helped, you know, we've lost some lobster boats to some competition and Hey, that's fair competition. Deal with it. How do you get better right at what you do? How do you solve a need 
that's in the industry, right? And, you know, we saw our need with fresh seafood and, and during the pandemic and now in going forward, now it's like, all right, now how do you make the seafood market better? How do you expand, right? Do you scale up, you know? And, you know, you could go days without posting on social media and just be irrelevant and, and just fall asleep at the wheel and you're gonna go out of business. You know, there's no question about it. Your expenses are gonna be there every single week, every month. Um, I don't want to lay guys off. That's not something we, we like to do. Luckily, we haven't had to. Um, and, and that's what we take pride in, too, is a lot of our workforce. So if we can keep this business going and expand, you know, we're, we're learning, too, just like the Kauai fishermen and, and other fishermen that want to try to sell. You know, it's a constantly evolving thing. And, you know, there's, I don't think there's one avenue that you got to do, whether it be value-added product, frozen product. I think you got to do a little bit of everything because... All it takes is a pandemic, something different, some government regulations. And if you can't adapt to that, to something, then you're going to go out of business. Uh, so that's even where we're at. We're still learning. We're learning and we're going to you know, keep growing with it. And we're young, at least that we can keep going through this pain. But uh, that's kind of how we got in the business and where we're at. Wow, great. V Vito, that's, um, you gave it in a nutshell, an awful lot of work that you and your brothers did and would you mind um a lot to think about there w would you mind commenting i mean you, you clearly are clear-eyed looking at the market and mm -hmm. everybody knows that seafood demand is going up and up and up demand for all kinds of products is just skyrocketing and so i mean i know you face the you know the reality that i think bob and dave um, well everybody alludes to the big box are buying fish coming in um, mm -hmm. in fillets and, and stuff. And we're all trying to buy fresh local, et cetera, et cetera. There's a much higher cost to pay for fresh local. We all know that. But what, what are your thoughts on, so you look a couple of years down the road and knowing that the demand for uh, seafood and protein is going up, what, what are your thoughts about, what do you think in a couple of years? Do you think things, do you think you're gonna be selling a lot more local product? or whatever, whatever, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, at least it's not just seafood that's that's going up in price. It's, you know, other things too, like meat, and we want to stay competitive too with that. You know, you don't want to be so expensive that people just say, hey, I'm not going to buy seafood anymore. I can't afford it. So, you know, it's it stinks seeing some of the prices that we have to go to, but our margins always stay the same. You have to have your margins there. You just, you're better off shutting the doors. You're not a charity, right? Um, so, but I do, I think there's so much of an offering of seafood that's come through, comes through our port and there is some, some, inex, you know, less expensive items like redfish and stuff that I'd like to get out there. But I think, yeah, I think there's going to be more demand for seafood, um, you know, especially with shipping constraints. So I think we'll have an advantage in that aspect. And I think that is going to be accessibility, right? So that's why I want to try to get the shipping aspect going. Um, but yeah, I do. I think there'll be more of a demand for local. I think, um, you know, that's already been happening for years and years. Um, so yeah, I mean, hopefully it helps in that aspect, but it's, it's such a mess out there. I mean, it's just a crazy, crazy environment that we're living in. So, but hopefully it helps, you know, create some stability with the government contracts. They, there was some uh, government contracts out there this year for Pollock uh, and, that helped our fishermen kind of give them a more of a stable price. There was a floor at least where before it would go to Canadian salt markets and, you know, any type of volumes would just collapse the market. Um, so at least if, if things like that happen, then I see it like a little bit of a brighter future and for the, you know, the fishery that we have. Great. And um, well, great. We hope. And mm. another, um, one more question, if you don't mind. Um, and again, thanks for all of your presentation. I mean, all of your comments are, as you said, apropos to every every business and particularly uh, fresh fish and seafood. Um, even now, there's efforts to get basically people like uh, all of your businesses in front of consumers and educating the public. And Bob Campbell mentioned that, um, that I know you can't do everything. We know that you have enough on your plate. Um, any thoughts on uh, how can people help? Can local communities and governments 
start thinking about um, how they might support uh, industries such as yours. And you said fisheries regulations and management can help, but um, you see a lot of support for, um, say, in Kauai, agricultural products are really important food security. Do you think, um, at least on the mainland, is seafood recognized as important to, to food security or has it been left out? Maybe that question is too broad ranging, but what I'm getting at is seafood is not exactly piped into the food distribution for um, uh, schools, uh, you know, large scale places where people are fed or kids. Um, do you see that changing where there'll be more of an effort to get fresh fish onto um, school kids diets and hospitals and what have you? And that's my last question. I, I certainly hope so. Um, I know there was that USDA contract that I was talking about that definitely helped. Um, and I'm not sure where that went, what institutions could have been, could have been schools or jails, I'm not sure, but hopefully they can implement that. That should always have been there. Um, I think years ago, there was an army contract that the Gloucester used to have. Hopefully we can get stuff like that back. I think the pandemic forced these things, these issues, hopefully open the eyes up to to it you know a lot of it was just the fishermen just kept getting beat down and nobody really saw the importance to it until the pandemic happened and so hopefully you know that can get in front of you know some legislation and, and they can continue stuff like the usda contracts um so yeah hopefully that continues thanks that's a really good point and one thing we learned in the state of Hawaii, um, the FDA grants that were available to diversification value added, it wasn't really well known that they were also available to ocean producers and till very recently. And so that's something we hope will change. And so I'm really glad you mentioned that as well, that uh, USDA FDA grants that are there, money on the table for business um, expanding and diversifying. So once again, Vito Gigoloni Jr., thanks. And I, I mentioned to our audience and for uh, people that will be uh, listening in on the recorded versions that these guys and women have agreed to um, deal with some follow-up questions if there are any as part of their um, talk story and engagement with our Kauai fleet and community. So um, thanks again. And I'm gonna remind everybody one more time too that this is being recorded. So uh, just that's for your information. Thanks a lot, Vito. I'm gonna move on Thank to our, our next speaker. Um, our next speaker is Anne Malloy of Ocean Crest for uh, uh, Seafood and also um, Neptune's Harvest. Anne, I'm gonna ask you, can we unmute you? <clears throat> there you are. There you go. Um, I know Anne Malloy personally for a number of years uh, through her involvement in our Gloucester community and harbor development efforts, um, among many other things. And I must say that Anne is also, like all of our other previous speakers, incredibly well known in the New England community, in fishing communities, for her advocacy for fishermen and fishing communities. So her expertise. Uh, speaks to not just her family's business, which is Neptune's Harvest, an incredibly successful, um, uh, which shall we, shall we say, fertilizing um, enterprise, fertilized enterprise, but her family, uh, as the others, have been involved um, for, for decades. And her community leadership is something that I've always admired, in addition to her knowledge and expertise of the fertilizer business from ocean products. Um, and is she's also um, got a lot of, uh, let's say recognition online. She leads in thinking about how um, ocean products are very useful and important for growing things in agriculture. Um, her leadership there is incredible. You can find her online. By the way, we're going to post links to all of our experts uh, websites and social media so you can follow up on them and learn more about them. And I also encourage you to read their bio, bios, which are included on our social media, um, on Facebook and Instagram, and soon to come website. So um, that's a short introduction to Anne Malloy uh, of Gloucester Mass and Neptune's Harvest. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, so yeah, it's a family business. Um, 
My uh, grandfather in the 1920s bought the wharf where we are at right now um, in Gloucester Harbor. And he unloaded fishing boats. Uh, he was a fisherman back, you know, way back on the schooners even. And then um, bought a fish company and was doing fish. And then he started selling fuel oil to the fishermen. And this guy had a literally, um, he's from Sicily, English second language. And he started selling fuel oil to the fishermen and realized quickly that he was making more money selling fuel oil. So ended up going into the home eating business. And um, my dad had a seafood company. He was also a fisherman for years and he didn't, he didn't like being at sea all the time. My older brother was calling, you know, his father-in-law dad when he would come in from fishing. And he said, I, I really want a, a seafood wharf and I want to start selling fish and, and have a shore job. So um, in 1965, the city of Gloucester took that property by eminent domain to put our Coast Guard station. So he was forced out of there and he asked um, my grandfather, his father-in-law, you know, do you have any ideas of where to build? And he said, he said, I'll sell you my wharf and I'll, I'm just going to go into the home heating, you know, business. So my dad, I think, had an eighth grade education. So these these are just hard working entrepreneurs that are always thinking of the next step and ways to improve. And so in 1965, he started Ocean Crest Seafoods. And when we handled a lot of fish, a lot of whiting, we had the Seven Seas brand of whiting. And the salad dressing people actually bought the rights to that name, Seven Seas, from my dad and my uncle. But um, in the 80s, and we were unloading a lot of fish, and you know, there was a huge amount of fish coming across our docks in the 80s. And there was a company in Gloucester called the Dehyde, and they took the fish curry, the, the fish remains, and they made uh, pet food. And when they went out of business, we were forced to pay fishermen to take the gary back out to sea. And, you know, as you know, when you fillet a fish, like the ground fish, 60 to 70 percent is left over. You know, only 30, 40 percent is the fillet that people eat. So we had a huge amount of, of gary being brought back out to sea and dumped in the ocean. And it was expensive. It was bad for the environment. It was it, as it decomposed, it sucked the oxygen out of the water and created a dead zone. And it was just really wasteful. And we knew, you know, it made good fertilizer from, you know, you learn in school about the Indians doing it. And all the Gloucester fishermen always had the best tomatoes in the city because they would bury the, the fish <laughs> remains in their garden. So he had the foresight and, I, you know, I always say he had the guts to go into the fertilizer business. And it turned out to be, you know, the best decision he could have ever made because trying to make a living off of 30 to 40 percent of the fish we'd have been out of business by now with, with all the huge restrictions the government has put on the fishermen. So um, in 19, in the eighties, we, we started, uh, we got together with the University of Massachusetts Marine Station and they're the ones that helped us develop the process to liquefy it, stabilize it. So, so now we're utilizing hundred percent of the fish by, by turning the rest into organic fertilizer. And um, so we just grind it up and then the hydrolyzing tanks liquefy it and then we stabilize it so it won't rot and we screen it so it won't clog sprayers. And we were just selling it in bulk to farms. But then we realized, you know, like I, I came on board in the late 80s, early 90s. And I, I was like, we really should be bottling this because I was a consumer looking for fertilizer for my garden and all I saw was miracle grow in the stores I'm like I don't want to put chemicals on things I'm growing so I talked my dad into bottling it which really kind of created a, a job for me too into into doing that part and so he's like yeah sure you know take the ball and run with it and that's what you know I've been doing ever since what's 30 years or so I guess now but we um we started with just the fish fertilizer and then you go to the gardens, the garden distributors, and they're like, you know, we're not going to pick up your line for one product. So then we started diversifying into seaweed, fish and seaweed. And now we then we went into dry crab and lobster shell, another way to utilize 100% of the crab and lobsters and not waste any. And it, it's got great calcium. It makes great fertilizer. It's, it's high in something called chitin, which helps with a lot of insect damage and disease. So products from the ocean, like 
the whole world was under ocean water at one time. They, they found fish fossils on the top of Mount Everest. So you got to think maybe this is why it works so well. All the, the minerals that were in the soil over time with erosion and, you know, just kind of demineralized and loses a lot of those natural nutrients. So you put the fish fertilizer on there, some seaweed, crab and lobster, it just goes crazy and it works fantastic. So we've done nothing but grow um, ever since then. And, and we've expanded into like, we have a, a tomato and veg, a rose and flowering, a turf formula, lawn starter. We were micronizing the crab right now and lobster into this fine powder that stays in suspension. So we got a liquid crab and lobster now. So we're continuously evolving. Um, my son's with the company now. He's the fourth generation, and um, and he's um, he's running the warehouse. He's making all the specialty products. So we're just we have like sixteen or so family members in the business, and it's kept us all in business. You know, we wouldn't if you didn't diversify and keep doing all these new ideas, uh, we'd never be still alive. So I think um, anything you can do to keep keep up with the times. And then when the, the, the pandemic hit, everybody wants to grow their own food. So they're really, you know, it, and, um, and it had a lot of silver linings. And one was local, sustainable. People are worried about food security. They want to buy local fish. They want to use organic fertilizer. They want to grow their own food. Um, and then with cannabis becoming legal in so many places, we have all those growers that love our product. So there's just a lot of reasons that we've, we've been growing all the time. And we, you know, we keep hiring new people and expanding. We, we do sell to Hawaii. We sell um, to um, the Kapolea golf course and the plantation golf course. And those are PGA courses. And they're, you know, we're shipping them fish fertilizer all the way from Gloucester it just works fantastic. So we're, we're really, we have international customers. We're, we're loading containers all over to different countries even. So it's just uh, really expanded. And we still have a seafood business. We still, we sell a lot of the local restaurants in the North Shore here. And we do sell to hospitals actually um, in Boston. We, we ship fish up there every day. So we're, we're keep, keeping the fish going because of the fertilizer, I think, at this point. But the two are a really good synergy and work great together. We couldn't have one without the other. So they work great together. And we're, we're keeping a lot of family and other people in the town employed. So it's been it's kind of a good success story with a lot of people without degrees, just hard work and ambition and foresight, you know, and, and guts to take on new projects and step into the unknown and, and spend money to invest in these ideas that luckily for us have really worked out well. well that's, that's basically what we do. Well, what you've done and thanks very much for that. I mean, that's, I know as the other speakers, you've condensed incredible history and uh, thinking and planning into a very short spiel. And um, I can tell that um, it's hard to convey how much uh, dedication and initiative um, is behind all of that in all of your businesses. And would you mind, um, you and I have talked a little bit over the years. Uh, by the way, this project goes back to 2019. Um, and when we started talking about how th these, these experts could help Kauai think about what we could do better with our fish and our, our fleet and our um, diversification opportunities. But Anne knows that Kauai is uh, very much an agricultural, um, besides tourism, we have agriculture here, we grow things. And now we have what I've read is, and you would be the expert, that uh, uh, fertilizers have been coming in from places like, dare I say Russia or Ukraine or the supply chain, but You've mentioned that it took a lot of, uh, you said investment and money for Neptune's Harvest to do what you do. Do you have any, and I know I've, you've said it's pretty much important that it's gotta be at that scale. Given that there's small islands here, um, or at least um, probably the volume of fish uh, that and, and amount of investment that would be needed to do a startup for just for local um, fertilizer, do you know of any uh, history besides Native Americans that did on small scale 
um, took their racks and their gurry and did something with it. Um, is it absolutely impossible, do you think, to have a local fertilizer option, say, for local farmers? Or is the scale of what you do uh, it just got to be at such a scale to be cost effective? Um, so the way we make our fertilizer, it takes 10 pounds of gurry to make one gallon of fish. So if we grind 5,000 pounds of gurry in a day, that's only going to make 500 gallons. And we have a 5,000 gallon tanker truck that we ship all over the country. You know, he just came back from, um, we have our own truck, our own driver. He just came back from Ohio and he's loading now to go back to, to go out to Minnesota. So, you know, that's 50,000 pounds of gurry for every tanker that we ship out. So you need a lot to make a little, but you could do a smaller scale. It cost us probably at least a million dollars in the eighties. And luckily we had a seafood company to, to help us with all that expense that was thriving back then before all the restrictions, you know, really hit home. But um, there's probably a way to do a small scale and grind it up and liquefy it and stabilize it and, you know, ship it out. But to do what we do for the volume we do, you know, we are looking at a million dollars and it took us about 10 years to perfect it also. It was a lot of trial and error. And, you know, it didn't happen quickly. And, you know, we really didn't know what we were doing either. If you knew what you were doing, it probably wouldn't have taken as long, but we were on the job training. We we're kind of pioneers um, of what we were doing at the time. Uh, I think there's some small scale examples. I know there was an Indian um, reservation in Minnesota that had some lake fish and they were trying to do it for their crops. Uh, the beauty is if you can figure out a way to do it, the, the, the fish has everything in it. It's not just like the chemicals, like you say, from Russia, Ukraine, whatever. A lot of these are just nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, like miracle Grow. That's all you're getting is your three main components. Um, and it's high, like a miracle Grow is a 20, 20, 20 NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. The fish is a two, four, one, much lower. But with the fish, you're getting micronutrients, trace elements, amino acids, vitamins, enzymes, minerals growth hormones that are naturally in fish that make fish grow. Then you've got all your omega oils. So it's really healthy for the plants. Also, another avenue is we sell a lot of it for animal feed. You can spray it on um, 10 gallons per ton of feed and you can replace soybean for protein, it makes a better quality feed. It's less expensive. It keeps the dust down on the feed piles. So a lot of the farmers we sell to spray it on their feed. Um, so that's another option. Um, the crab and lobster shell can be sold to pet food companies. Um, there's, there's a lot of other things too that can be used, just not even uh, fertilizer. So there, there's a lot of avenues and ways to think about it. Um, I don't know if there's grants available or people that have some money that'd like to invest in something like that down there. Um, maybe you could do it on a smaller scale. All right. Well, thank you for those comments. They're, they're really give people things to think about. Um, and again, thanks a lot for your participation today. I'm really, I was so thrilled to get you to talk about this. So thanks again. And, and like I said before, we, we will post links to all of our experts, uh, panels, um, home um, businesses, and social media and websites. So thanks again. Um, thanks, thank Anne. And I'm going to ask um, our last uh, participant today, um, Dave, is Captain Dave Marciano. I'm going to ask him to unmute. Okay. Yeah, there we are. There you are. Hi, Dave. I'm going to introduce Captain Dave Marciano of Angelica Fisheries. Um, of, I, too, know Captain Marciano for many years, uh, both from his before tuna, I knew Dave as a ground fish fisherman, like some of our other speakers, is well known to the Gloucester and New England fishing community as a captain, as an outspoken uh, 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 proponent of local fisheries, of speaking up for the value of fresh local. Um, but I was particularly interested in Dave's experience uh, more recently among his long uh, history in various um, ground fish. I don't think you are a lobsterman, Dave. I don't know if you were or not, but um, what really struck me in addition to 
a role that he has that I try not to push out in front of everybody because he's here today as a fisheries expert, um, as well as the star of Wicked Tuna. And I will also add extremely well known in all the Hawaiian islands for his role as the captain of hard merchandise and Angelica. But Dave, I, I learned was selling his uh, bluefin tuna catch direct to, as he told me, at least to a restaurant. And if I'm right, Dave, is it New England fisheries, fish, New England fishmongers and, uh, and probably others. And I also heard him talk about other ideas about diversification. And so in addition to being a longtime commercial fisherman and a proponent and, and an outspoken advocate for fish, US fishermen, he has diversified both more recently by selling direct to um, uh, purchasers and also diversifying his family business by being a, a television star on Wicked Tuna. Um, and Wicked Tuna, as others have mentioned, um, I know personally that Dave is always advocating for the importance and the value of our US fishermen and what they're contributing to our, our health and, um, and food security in the US. So he is um, basically covering a lot of ground in his own fishing business, his own diversified fishing business. So with that, I'd like to do, introduce Captain Marciano and um, welcome Dave and thanks for tuning in, appreciate it. Sure, thank you and uh, thanks all the other participants. That was uh, very educational for me. You know, I kind of know all these folks if in a, or a roundabout way, but uh, you know, I learned so much more tonight. So it's great to hear from all of you. Um, and I guess from the fisherman's perspective, what I would add is, you know, it's a great thing you're working on to protect these smaller boats. You know, as you've heard, um, as you've heard, you know, our industry has evolved as a ground fish industry. You know, when I first got my first boat, there was 2,700 active ground fishermen in the tri-state area, Maine, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire. Right now, there's about 80 boats left. And they're, you know, the small boat fleet is extinct for uh, all practical purposes, right? It's just the way the cookie crumbled. Um, and there's, you know, so protecting these smaller boats, like you guys, uh, I think you got a great idea to try and figure out how to keep these little guys going and diversifying like, like uh, they have. You know, my story is, you know, like all the others here, we've had to figure out ways to continue to stay in business in the fishing industry in some form or another because of those regulatory changes. Um, you know, that none of us could kind of predict. We all had to learn how to adapt and overcome and, and change the way we think about things uh, as individuals. And it was great to hear the other stories. You know, as a fisherman for myself, um, you know, and, and I've done commercial fishing from Maine to Key West, Florida. And, you know, my predominant fishery was always gill netting and long lining bottom fishing uh bought ground fish in new england and um you know tuna was always a part of it and then for me now i guess my little life ring if you will uh to survive the regulatory process was this idea of wicked tuna when they came along i never imagined it growing into what it is today uh but i was thinking well i still have my boat we always did a few charters, you know, charters carrying passengers for hire was one of the things we did early on to try and, um, you know, do something with the boat when, you know, like some of the regulatory things that went into place, close certain areas to commercial fishing, but you know, under the recreational rules, you were allowed to fish in there for certain months. So, you know, doing charters was a way to keep the boat busy. And uh, so I saw that opportunity with the TV thing, you know, again, never expecting it to grow as much as it has. But as a charter boat operator, I was, well, it's a great opportunity 
to promote my charter business, right? I mean, what an opportunity uh, it was. And that's been the biggest uh, plus to come from all of that. You know, we that's how we went from, you know, we had one boat, now we have two boats. And, the, you know, my, my son runs the hard merchandise. I run the Falcon. We have a thriving far higher uh, fishery for both our uh, bottom fish in New England, Attic Cod, Pollock. And of course, tuner is a big part of what we do, both for hire and in the commercial sale. And, um, you know, one of the, I guess, the positives that came out of the pandemic was this notion of distributing these tuner in particular now that we catch to the local community. Um, you know, I, I always watched uh, Vito. He His facility is right adjacent to where I tie up. And, you know, they were on the ball when, when this all started. Um, you know, I always was impressed the way, you know, they got out there first with their curbside service and, and things like that. And, you know, I was just sitting back watching all that unfold myself going, he's on to something there. That's a way... That's a way forward. I could see that. So it was always great. And, you know, that way I would I would support him when I could on social media and all that, because that's a way of the world too these days, whether you whether you like it or not, social media is part of the business model. I mean, it's free advertising if you think about it like that, with you know, middle of amount of effort, you can get your product and your company's product in view of a lot of people. And especially, I think it's valuable if your target is the local, the local community. Because let's face it, through that social media networking, you know, a big part of it winds up being people who are going to access your local product, right? So that's a great part of the formula to be adding in. You know, these are the people who are going to drive into your little fish market or where your, your farmer's market to access these products. So social media uh, has definitely should be a big part of it. I think that's a great thing. Um, you know, and that being said, how do we go forward as fishermen? And I think, you know, hearing the other buyers, the way, you know, the, the other, the other folks in the, in the industry, uh, you know, they get it too, right? We, we, this, I think a big part of what we all have to do is expanding this domestic market. And then um, Bob brought up, you know, the bluefin tuna. Now that's a great one. And, and this is just my opinion, Bob, but, you know, cause I get a lot of flack sometimes when people say, oh, you're, you're, you're on TV catching an endangered species. And I think, what they do is they intentionally confuse Pacific bluefin tuna, which is in a you know completely different situation as our Atlantic giant bluefin tuna. And I think those, you know, that that don't like what we all do in the business we're all in, you know, exploit that um, greatly when it comes to you know that that bluefin tuna stock because uh, the bluefin tuna stock at least as far as the numbers are concerned for that Pacific bluefin, you know, it's completely different than our status of the stock for our Atlantic bluefin. Now as a fisherman, and I talk with the fishermen on the West Coast, and, you know, they're seeing more of those bluefins than they have seen in literally 40 or 50 years. So we could have a debate on whether that science is a pro, but that's a fisherman's job is to, I guess, always argue about the science. But, you know, that being said too, in spite of the difficulties and the challenges with the federal regulatory process and how frustrating at times as a fisherman or any other part of the business it can be, you know, ultimately, I think we all support the idea of a healthy ecosystem out there. Um, but again, when you, when you add in the federal government is the one in charge of leading this parade and there's at times again from a fisherman's perspective and i'm sure the buyers as well have their own host of challenges with dealing with the federal regulatory process uh 
you know, again, it, it, I fully support it, but it, I, I'll, I'll admit freely, it, it can be frustrating and aggravating at times. But, uh, you know, overall, we've been very blessed to, at least speaking for myself, uh, you know, the opportunities that I've had, my only regrets with any of it is, you know, I wish I could bring, there's so many other fishermen in, in, in Gloucester that could have used the same opportunity I have and, you know, and deserve it every bit as much as I do. And I just wish I could bring more of those guys along for the ride when it comes to the opportunities that I've had. But unfortunately, that's not how it works. You know, I've had an opportunity and I'm simply trying to do the best I can with that opportunity, you know, for our family. And, you know, and that's why, too, I try to be supportive of the fishing industry in general, because at least now, you know, I do have a voice that is somewhat amplified. You know, and like I wish I had this, I wish I had this opportunity back 10 or 15 years ago when having public support for what we try to do as fishermen when it comes to working with the federal government. You know, it would have been great to, you know, if we needed letters from the public to send to the powers that be that are managing fisheries. You know, if I asked my fan base now to send some letters, you know, we, we could get some letters written. But, you know, that's neither here nor there. Um, I've been, again, I'll, I'll be the first to admit I'm very fortunate. I'm not special. I just had an opportunity. So I'm, I'm working to uh, do the best I can. And I'm, that's why I'm always happy to support, you know, businesses like Vito's or Ann's uh, or, or Bob you know, in any way I can, because I feel obligated, you know, given my history with the fishing industry, I'm happy to support, um, you know, the guys that are left. I think that's important. And that's why when you asked if I would participate in this, when you explained what you were trying to do down there, of course, I uh, fully support all, all of that. And, you know, I definitely hope someday I get down there to meet you know, all the fishermen on the island. And, you know, that's been one of the benefits to me, um, you know, that's come out of the show, kind of. I've had opportunities. Uh, you know, I've gone on fishing trips and met fish, you know, on fisheries that I never even imagined myself doing. And that's all stemmed out of that popularity for the show, you know. we So, you know, I've been to Australia fishing those um, southern bluefin, on the west coast fishing the pacific bluefin and uh you know in italy i've been invited to italy and we've gone to italy twice now fishing those mediterranean bluefin so those are all opportunities that we're very fortunate to be able to participate in and that's all stemmed from my opportunity from the show dave thanks those are really important points and i know um, you're vastly understating your influence as far as uh, changing some perceptions. Uh, for the most part, you have the good ones of, of our New England bluefin commercial fishery and charter fishery, but uh, you're very good. I, you made a really important point about social media, which is um, a potential really um, interesting and feasible way for Kauai fishermen to get out more fish until the infrastructure is here. Um, at the community, say in commercial kitchen or community kitchen. Our biggest challenge here is among many is that many of our small boat fishermen don't have a place to process. But one thing you, you mentioned too, uh, social media and branding. And let's face it, you are a big brand, but um, what are your thoughts about um, the importance of branding